Well, I realized recently that I am such a Jew because I wrote my art lecture on a scroll. <laughs> and it didn't mean to happen this way, it just did. <laughs> Um, so, um, this is Magic Fingers, and it's actually the first of my inhabited sculptures that I made. And, uh, sorry, this is going to be kicking my <laughs> And, um, so, uh, basically what it is, is it's just the hand, uh, me standing behind the wall with uh, my hand in the frame, and I had my hand, uh, held my hand in art historical gestures. At first, I, when I was behind the wall, I would look at uh, art history books and for hand gestures. And then after a while, I just kind of got used to them. Um, I moved very slowly, uh, so you would, it would be very still, and then I would move. Um, and I did this uh, first for three weeks at an art gallery, and then I was invited to do it again at PS1 for six months. Um, and so every, for actually about four times a week, I went to PS1 and did it for the, while they were open. And then, um, you know, so um, I don't usually take videos of these work because I consider this more like a painting or, or an inset sculpture, and you wouldn't take a video of paintings or sculptures. So, but I did for this one, so I can show you. <laughs> real footage to it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that that when he's looking at me, I just happened to turn after he walked away at the very moment. But it was a good clip to choose. So, um, so why incorporate my body into my work? Uh, my, my most important reason for doing so is because I wanted to push the boundaries of what a Duchamp and ready-made could be. And um, if, I can, if you can incorporate or appropriate any object and make it into a ready-made, then what, about, what would happen if you used a human body? And, um, and what are the implications of that if you use the human body? Can it be sold? Can it, um, you know, if I want to take a break, what if the exhibition is six months long, then what happens? And um, what does it mean for the longevity of the artwork if it's made from ephemeral materials, and how can um, I accommodate that? So this was my solution, which is to put a will return sign in the frame when I'm not there to show when I'll come back. And um, the sign solves all these problems, um, and the thing is, is it, it can go on indefinitely because no one knows which 10 a.m. p.m. I might be there. And, um, but then of course there's a conceit, which is that one day I might not, I won't return. And so what happens is the will return sign, which starts out talking about me coming back and, um, and uh, eventually, so it's like, you know, focus on my presence. Eventually it starts to become a focus on my absence because you start to think, wait a minute, she's not going to come back. So in the way, in the end, what I think about these works is they're, you know, they're about me being there, but they're also about me not being there. And um, so uh, that theme of presence and absence, you'll find, I keep finding, reoccurs in my work, yeah. along with the will return sign. So um, uh, sometimes the theme of absence is presented in funny ways, um, and there's always a dark side of the humor. Um, in so much of uh, our world becomes a metaphor for the passage of time or mortality within my work, um, including the trappings of the world of commerce. And like this is a uh, necklace display, and um, I'm always turning to the writings of Walter Benjamin, or 
people say Benjamin, but then they don't say Walter. <laughs> so it's <laughs> like, is it Walter Benjamin or is it Walter Benjamin? I don't, you know. <laughs> uh, um, so I think about his reasons for why he embarked on the arcade projects. And uh, he, in, when he was um, working on the project, he would, was living in Paris and he had wandered through the arcades there that um, at the time were um, outdated, there were outdated shopping malls that had old shops still operating, like um, that were selling old products, like corsets, but he was writing in the 30s when women were no longer wearing corsets, and hair tonics when, at a time when women had bobs, so they weren't needing the hair tonics. And he started to see the arcades as a kind of urban ruin, and, um, and and started to think about, sorry, he wrote a lot about fashion as this marker of time. And um, and what is fashion, what is in fashion today is out the next. And so fashion becomes something that uh, makes us think about our own mortality because we think about the passage of time and how something has gone out of fashion. And there's this idea of the just past and that we we actually recoil when we see something that is just out of fashion because it reminds us of the passage of time. Like, I don't know, I mean, I hate to give an example because there's, I will say, a bell bottom pants, but you know, people are wearing, you know. <laughs> At one point I said Uggs and then I realized everyone was wearing Uggs in the room, so Uggs are not out of fashion. But you know, yeah. but there's like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you see something, you're like, ew, I don't want to wear that. But it's actually that recoil could actually be us just thinking about uh, how we're, we're getting older and time is moving on. And, um, so fa and fashion is so tied to the new that seeing something out of fashion makes us recoil and horror. And um, so anyway, using that, thinking about that, I um, often incorporate um, images from and objects from the world of commerce, um, but there's a twist. So here, um, this is a necklace display, and there's, um, it's wearing a locket, but the locket is missing its portrait, um, and there, it's kind of a Russian doll of display in a way, because it's, it's um, a pedestal on a pedestal on a pedestal. So it's also thinking about, um, like a fractal of display. Um, so then, um, the will return sign also comes from the world of commerce, as you would know from seeing it in a window, a shop window. But um, what's interesting is that it's very American. When I've gone to other countries and I try to put up the will return sign, and um, some countries in Europe will have something similar, but they'll be like in Berlin, they have something for parking that's a clock, but it's not quite the same. And when you do see the will return sign in other countries, it's often the American version. Um, so I, I didn't know that this was something that we invented, but <laughs> apparently. Um, anyway, with, with this, um, this was, the wrong gallery was, um, they made this sort of shop windows, and then they would invite artists to um, put works in the shop windows. Um, and so, but this, in the window is only 11 inches deep, and they asked me to do something like a performance. And uh, because it was, I could barely fit in there, I decided not to do anything but to put this will return sign in. And the will return sign actually has an automated clock behind it. So, and there's no second hand. So the, the, um, the hour and the minute hands are moving very slowly and the clock is always set 10 minutes ahead. So somebody come, they see the will return sign and they come at the time when the clock is, uh, when, it's, it'll be 10 minutes faster than when. So it's like um, always this like, per per perpetual postponement of um, the performance and my presence. Um, and uh, let's see, so in the other space, so the, well, the wrong gallery had two spaces, and then this is the other space, and actually the words are reversed on purpose. The, the gallery did that by um, the door has the words backwards. So. Um, what you're doing is you're standing outside looking in. And so I decided to play with that inside-outside reversal and put a pile of ice on the inside of the space. And, um, and I, I sort of was able, it was so cold when I installed it. It was the beginning of January. And it was starting to form this, able to form this like 
very clean um, cone, and then I put, uh, I made the cone as high as my head, so in the end it was actually 900 pounds of ice. And um, I made the, um, yeah, the, the cone is about my height, and I put a top hat on top. And the idea is that um, as the seasons would change, because um, this was installed in January, and I knew that it was, it was over in April, so the I had a season change. So as the seasons changed, the top hat would um, slowly, the ice would melt, and the top hat would slowly perform as like, a dance, in a way, as it would go to the ground. Um, this is about um, the beginning of March, and so where you can see the top hat is down. And I originally had hoped there would be a big puddle and that it would melt faster, but actually it melted so slowly that it was, um, you know, there was actually very little puddle. But and the, the hope for the puddle was that people, passers-by on the street would walk by and their footprints would go through the puddle and you would see footprints walking away. But that didn't happen, but I still think of it as like a disappearing act because it evaporated. Um, and let's see. <clears throat> so um, performance and uh, performance iconography and uh, iconography theater, um, especially in vaudeville, um, and uh, top top hats, canes, curtains is um, is a subject in my work. I use it a lot in, as imagery in my work, and um, it's interesting because I. I do performance, but I'll, I'll use my body like a performance, but I actually don't call them performances because I think of them as me becoming part of sculpture, not performance. So, uh, but I use the imagery of performance, so it's very confusing. <laughs> um, and as, yeah, when I am in my work, I don't actually say I'm performing, I'm inhabiting the work. So that's, for me, that's different. Um, in this exhibition, there was a, um, there was a player piano, and it played a um, ragtime version of the Bee Gees' Staying Alive, which, if you saw the video um, dancing over there, that's the same. That was actually performed by this piano, but uh, because it's a player piano, there's um, no performers. But we actually, because in the video over there, there was me and a skeleton, so we actually um, I had my husband, who's a composer, I commissioned him to write it, to, write, to arrange the, the BG Staying Alive, and he did it for two, for four hands, so there's two people sitting there playing it. That's why it's very elaborate. Um, and um, so then there's a small um, stage or theater set right there with the curtains, and I'm actually the rigger, and I'm standing behind the curtain, and in, in this shot you can see my foot, but um, most of the time you can't. The curtains were just moving back and forth and dancing to the song and um, like this. So they were open and closed, and then there was a big open, you know. And then um, in the corner um, was um, that video which you saw, and um, and it, so that with the video and, of the skeleton and myself. Animatronic skeleton and me, and I'm trying to mimic the moves of the skeleton, and uh, so there's a confusion of what is automated and what is not automated with the player piano and the animatronic skeleton, and then you see the curtains dancing, and most people assume it's automated because they didn't see my foot or, um, and um, let's see. So with this video. Um, we're doing a synchronized dance, and it's based on, as you probably guessed, the um, Baroque imagery of the Dance of Death, yeah. which, if you're not familiar with, was um, is a, a genre that was um, since late Middle Ages through 18th century used quite a lot of images like 
you might see one by a Holbein did a whole series, and it was uh, the skeleton, and then everyday people like a baker or the Duchess dancing with a skeleton, and or sometimes the skeletons playing an instrument. And the idea is that when the music is over and the dance is over, then the person who is the baker dies or the Duchess dies. In my case, uh, this video is us dancing, but it's on an infinite loop, and it just keeps going and going and going. And when you play the, um, put it on a DVD player, then you have it on a con continuous loop. So it never ends. It just goes and goes and goes. So it's actually subverting the idea of the dance of death and actually suggesting that maybe it's like, you know, dance of immortality. Um, which is, you know, so it's kind of like my update of the Vanitas genre, which you'll see in my other work. Um, okay, so the intermission sign is another um, imagery from the theater. And what if the, if the um, performance technically went into intermission indefinitely, then you would also have a never ending performance. And, um, so um, also what's interesting to me often is the periphery of what's happening in performance and not actually the, the main performance. So um, uh, my interest in curtains and intermission signs. Um, and um, there's another, um, as you saw, with there's clown drawings. I do watercolors as well. And these are uh, actually the um, borders of intertitles from silent films. So um, they truly emphasize um, that the silence of the silent film by focusing on what is seen around the text um, but cannot be read, which is another example of me looking at just outside of what's the main focus. Um, so as you'll notice in a lot of my inhabited work and other works where I use my body, um, I often don't use my face, and um, or when you do see my face, it's because I'm playing a character um, rather than actually me, and um, and I started. To, I've been thinking a lot about that in the last few years, and especially this year. And um, at, I think it be. I began making art in a moment when identity art was really so prevalent and I was maybe in a mode of thinking to idealist, so idealistically that um, I, and I was um, like, I don't want to make work that talks about my gender or about my personal experience. And, um, and I had been studying you know, I don't know, like Jackson, I was reading on, you know, Jackson Pollard, just like abstract expressionist and this, it just said, was, you know, just like a feminist uh, response of, um, of it being so much about the personality of the artist. And I wanted to avoid that. And, um, and so then um, I ended up making this show that was, um, thinking about the face of the artist and about how um, the identity of a person is in their face and in their head. And so I started researching headlessness and what does it mean to make our work and where you remove the head and there's no identity. And started to, um, and I landed on Georges Bataille's um, acephalic figure, which is a headless figure. And as you probably know, this surrealism is an um, influence in my work and Bataille was a surreal, surrealist. Um, writer. And um, the Asafal is this figure that he was obsessed with and is um, it's like a mythological figure that, uh, or a character that pose possesses the traits of being alive when they should actually be dead, like a vampire or a zombie or the headless horseman, which is also another Asafal figure. But for Bataille, um, who he had a secret society and an encyclopedia and a publication based on um, this figure, and it, he did, and it, the idea was that the Asafala figure was an um, ideal citizen uh, because um, it was a um, it was a figure born out of a society that decapitated its leaders through the French Revolution. Anyway, 
but for me, I was um, the also, I was interested in how he would portray the Asafal as free from reason and domination and identity. And uh, so for my project, I was I decided to make a magician that was headless. Um, and because a, a magician's trade and artifice and illusion and um, become a screen for a screen for pro projecting our desires and um, can be compounded without a head. And um, so here, this is a two channel video. Uh, the Headless Magician plays musical saw, which was popular during the vaudeville entertainment era. And but it sounds like a woman singing. And, um, and then there's an oscillating fan that is accompanying with um, the, you'll see that, I'll play the video. It's, and so there's air blowing over bottles of water and um, creating sound. So. It works, you can set it up. And I mean, it's very quiet. This is actually, I had to do it in a studio, so I could So I had my husband And the thing about the musical saw is that while it also sounds like a woman singing, 
it is used as, uh, or a saw is used as the instrument of decapitation in the grand saw the lady illusion. And so I decided to use that illusion and um, to create a sort of hospitalic figure of the magician um, by sawing the magician's head off. So, um, so there's this, so this is the saw the lady and, um, and the idea is that when uh, the magician's not there, there's a will return sign, but the head remains so that there's an ossophallic figure walking around, um, you know. Um. And so also within the installation was this work, which is another head surrogate um, here at LAMP. It's plugged into the clapper, and, um, and there's a video of hands clapping to turn on and off the lamp. And so the lamp actually acts like a performer, turns on. And um, if you don't know the clapper, it's just, maybe there's somebody from Europe here. This is the clapper. It's like uh, clap on, clap off, and then it uses a, it's um, sound activated and a um, specific uh, clapping rhythm to turn on and off electrical things. So um, the clapper kind of becomes like a surrogate for ears, so another head. Um, and uh, anyway, so if I use my body and I'm trying to disregard my identity, um, you know, okay, short, white, Jewish, female, um, can this be a performance about me being, uh, like, just being a sculpture, um, like one of the other wax sculptures in the room, and without actually being me? And I, ho I used to hope that that was the case, and that I could say this is just a sculpture. Um, and then I'm standing very still, like in a wax museum, and um, I'm attempting to enact some sort of subject-object confusion. But I, don't, I started to change my mind after 2004, the events of 2014, and uh, the events I mean, Ferguson and the Eric Garner case, and I start to feel like I can't. We haven't moved on. I can't say that my identity doesn't matter, and that um, I don't know what it'll mean for my future work, and I'm. Sure, um, my focus will still remain on my body, but can I, will I be inhabiting myself more as myself? Because we have to acknowledge who we are. We can't pretend that race doesn't matter. So anyway, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. But, um, and I suspect that for a lot of artists, things will change after this year. But um, anyway. And this is me attempting to be um, an illusion of being a wax figure of Madame Tussauds. I just stood there very still. And actually, I did it um, while the museum was open. So um, people um, would, thought, oh, that is a very realistic wax figure. And unfortunately, I couldn't hold my pose for so long because I started laughing. So, But um, we did manage to get a, a photograph without anyone in the room. Um, so deception plays a role in my work, and um, appears. So this is you know, this work, which you've seen in the uh, galleries, appears to be a simple vase of flowers. And um, some, but the thing that's different about it is that some of the flowers are natural and some of them are artificial. And um, over time, the truth will be revealed in the flowers that are. Um, natural will wilt and reveal themselves. Um, so this question of what is real and what is fake um, is a huge theme, obviously. And um, I am always love this painting, um, which is, uh, addresses this question. Um, in, it's the, the, the painting by Magritte, obviously, the treason of images. It says, this is not a pipe, even though it appears to be a drawing of a pipe. Uh, so I decided to use this painting as a jumping off point for the ex an exhibition. Um, so when you walk into the room, there's this pipe sitting on a table. And the pipe, of course, references the painting. The shape of the table references the shape of the painting. Um, but there's smoke constantly wafting from the pipe. And the pipe is just sitting up right there. So you realize this is no ordinary pipe. Um, and so it's a pipe that's referencing its own illusion. And, um, and then you ask, OK, so um, where's the smoker of the pipe? And you walk, you see in the room there's a chair, and 
um, perhaps the smoker's in the chair, but when you look closer at the chair, the chair's empty and it just has human arms and legs. Um, painting asks, what, how does language and images work as stand-ins for the real thing, and how do we use metaphor? So when we say arm of a chair or leg of a chair, we're using human body parts as metaphor to describe the chair. So in this case, I replace those metaphors with the real thing and in a way demetaphorize the chair. Um, and then, of course, so uh, when I'm not there, there's a will return sign. And um, here's a better photo. <laughs> um, the chair collapses forward because it's missing its skeleton. And so with this work, which is in the gallery, uh, Sand Lamp, I use a similar strategy where uh, we recall the body, we call the body, like the body of a lamp is, you know, when we say this part of the lamp is a body of a lamp. And so I replace the body of the lamp with um, something equally ephemeral and material, which is wet sand. And like the body, this lamp has to be maintained in order to stay upright, so uh, the contemporary has to be constantly spray it with water. Um, and, um, and then if we don't, it'll collapse. Um, and then here's Magic Lamp, which um, is also in the gallery. And um, another instance where I'm playing with language and replacing the arm of the lamp with an arm, or with a real arm. And, um, and the light bulb stays lit as if by magic. And of course, when I'm not there, there's a will return sign uh, to indicate when I'll be back. And again, here's another work with, uh, in which I am inhabited um, and which asks questions of what is real and what is representation. Because if you think about, I decided, I was thinking about this classic question, this idea of abstraction, that abstraction is what it is and it's not representational. Um, it's, uh, so in this, it, you, I was thinking you can make the same case for the ready made because if you look at Duchamp's urinal, it's not representational. It is what it is. It's a urinal, even though it's been called art. Um, so I decided to combine that idea of um, using my body as a ready made with an abstract sculpture. And um, basically, it's an abstract gag on, uh, I mean, an abstract sculpture with found objects, including an arm and a leg. And um, there's a pop-up gag in the butt, which you can't see, which is one of those cans. And when you pull the lid off, it's, um, like a worm pops out, and um, and then the life preserver and fishnet stocking with tap shoe, and I think of the whole thing as like a snowball that's like rolling down the mountain and just collecting ideas as it goes. And um, even though it's wearing, it has a le leg, it's like a Christmas story, like the lamp with the leg. Um, it it can't dance because it just has one leg and it's stuck on a pedestal. <laughs> And I, mean, I was also thinking about those dancing, like, cigarette ads from the 40s. Um, um, and I also think about it in terms of, um, like, of Vladimir and Estragon, Estragon uh, in Waiting for Godot as um, a kind of, um, like, a, like a clown figure sitting there just waiting. And so um, it's... And the absence is made under, is understood in a different way because um, uh, oh yeah this is what it looks like when I'm not there which is um, there's a with a gone fishing sign before the gone the other life preserver says wishing I was fishing and then this one says gone fishing um, and so thinking about the clown idea the um, or just like this waiting clown, or like tramp, um, I decided to give it a patchwork exterior. Um, and uh, so, thinking of clowns <laughs> with these works are in the show. Uh, oh, actually, I think we have a different drawing. Um, um, I like clowns because they pop up unexpectedly, so they don't have they don't conform to the ideas of theater where you have a beginning, an intermission, and an end. Um, but they um, they're more, they're circus performers, and um, so they, they don't conf conform to time frame we understand. Um, and they have exaggerated bodies, giant noses, big feet, 
And um, so I decided to make this joke based on the joke of the clown shoe, which is if the clown shoe is funny because it's long, then this extend the joke by making the clown shoe even longer. And um, so in my world, bodies are stretchable and malleable, extendable, and um, parts can be taken out of context without gore. And um, in a sense, I use my body's raw material um, where objects become devoid of the thing that scares us and makes us, um, um, it's an ignoring of our mortality. And um, so, leads to this installation which questions of mortality versus immortality um, are addressed head on here where, um, and of course, absence and presence. And um, so if a candle is an object uh, with a mortality because it melts, then an oil lamp is, is immortal because it, even though it's lit, it can't melt. Uh, so, um, here's a theater set for Jean-Paul Sartre's play, No Exit, which is a play that takes place in hell, and all the actors in the play are um, dead. And, um, and so I took the set directions from the play, and, uh, which is 19th century drawing room with a fireplace with a bronze statue on the fireplace, and, um, and or it's like um, Second Empire style furniture, and including the savon or roller chair. Uh, which is a chair uh, named after the friar who founded the bam Bonfire of the Vanities in like the 1500s, I think. Um, anyway, um, it was my little vanity toss week. Um, but if you walk into the room, you see uh, there's like fire on everything. And you would think, okay, we, you know, everything's on fire. We, it's a pattern of things on fire. We should. Uh, put it out. And so you go looking for the fire hose, and this is what you find. And um, instead of water dispensing from the hose, there's a hand. So um, it's kind of a surreal joke in which um, what water, what should be used, what does use to put out fire, what doesn't burn, is actually does burn. So the hand um, is ephemeral too, and it leaves, you know, plus the hand has to have a coffee break. Uh, let's see, so this photo, which is in this exhibition, was also in that installation, and, um, and a hand attempting to extinguish a candle, but the candle's bending away to protect itself. Um, so I have one more work that I couldn't fit in thematically, but I'll show it to you. But which is, this is, um, it's called Rug, 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 Rug. And, um, just a stack of bodies based on the story, a story of illusion of Aesop's fable of the wolf in sheep's clothing and, and of the idea of being not trusting what you see. And here you have a wolf in sheep's clothing, uh, or it actually begins with, yeah, so there's a, there's a bear in, um, in sheep's clothing, the wolf is in the sheep's clothing, and then I'm in the wolf clothing, and then we're all on top of a rug. And so basically what it is, when, when you, it's like in a rug store, you, know, you have a stack of rugs, but it's also the history of civilization because it goes from caveman furniture to apartment furniture. <laughs> so that's all. <laughs>